Hey everyone and welcome back to another Unreal C++ tutorial and in this video we'll be looking at the player class and how to get this moving around. So by the end of the video you'll have something looking a little bit like this. So it's some very simple movement but I've programmed it in a way to specifically replicate the movement that we set up in the previous topic if you followed that one for character input binding and character movement. So I've quickly just gone through and changed the default pawn to use the character class that we set up previously. Changed the colors so it's obvious which ones we're using. So the character's blue, the pawn is yellow. And the main difference you can see in the movement is that the character class has some smoothing. It has an acceleration to the movement, whereas the pawn, because we're just setting this manually, is just either moving or not moving. Besides that, the setup is very similar. So if you're following along and you haven't seen the previous video, then the main thing is that we're setting the default pawn to be a blueprint variable of the pawn C++ class that I'm making. The inputs that I have set up are mainly just going to be focusing on the axis mappings this time which are the move forward and the move right and then the blueprint class itself for the pawn is simply uh, I've created all of this in blueprint. It's only the movement logic we're doing in C++. Just to save some time and get the visual representations across I've added a cube to show the, the player and to this I've added a spring arm and a camera component. And again, this is exactly the same as the spring arm and the camera component in the character class. One thing to note as well on the pawn is that I have a movement variable uh, called movement speed, which is how fast we're moving. And again, this is set to 500, which is what I ended up setting the character movement component walk speed to. So that was 500 units. So again, this is going to show us how we can add a speed offset to our character. With all of that detailed, I'm just going to head over to the IDE and we can start looking at some code. So to begin with, I'm in the header file. I've only made some very small, simple changes here. So at the bottom of the class, I've included a private section. The first thing that I've included is a method variable called f vector named movement direction. This is going to be used between a few different functions in a moment to calculate which way the pawn should be moving. And then the second variable is a float named movement speed set to a default of 500. And again, this is going to be the offset of how fast we want the pawn to move. I've provided this a U property of edit anywhere and put it in a category named movement. This is just so that I can change this in the viewport or in the blueprint and just to nest it in a category so it's easy to find. Next, we have our two void functions, the move forward and move right. And these are going to be the ones like if you've uh, followed the character tutorial, which by the way, I'd recommend just because getting character movement is a little bit easier. So that's a good one to start on because it has a lot of input functionality. And that was more of a focus on the input bindings, which I'm not going to cover in quite as much depth for this video. Uh, but in a similar way, these are just going to be bound to the input bindings when a button is pressed. So over in the code file, I'm going to go through this in order. So we'll start with the setup player input component. So I have two bind axis to the input component, one for move forward and one for move right. So again, these are the key bindings in the project settings spelt exactly the same way. Then it needs to know which object this would be bound to. So we're just going to pass in an object reference of this. And then we're going to call both of the functions. So that's the function on the A pawn base or the address of the A pawn base. And we have the move forward and the move right function. So this is constantly being called because these are axis bindings. And this will be updating whether the forward or back axis has been pressed or left or right. And then also whether or not it's been pressed at all. So if it's uh, released, then it's constantly returning zero. So we'll be multiplying a move offset of zero. So cancelling out any movement. Then we need to implement both of our functions. So that's the move forward and the move right functions, as these are the two functions being bound to. Then for the movement of both of these, I'm setting the move direction. So for the move forward, this is going to be the move direction dot X. Remember, that's the method variable that we've created previously. So this will be something that we can use throughout the code file. So for the move forward, this is, uh, as I said, the move direction dot X. So again, X is forward in Unreal. And I'm clamping this between a value. So I'm taking in the value which is being passed in and I'm clamping this between minus one or one. So that's going to be, uh, like I said, if we're pressing W, then that's gonna be one and S is going to be minus one, which will control whether we're moving forward or backwards. And we're just clamping this so that we can't hold multiple buttons at once and get past uh, a certain value. So this is to stop things like pressing W and D and returning something like 1.5 and going a little bit faster than you should be. 
Next, I'm doing exactly the same thing for the move right function. The only thing is we're swapping out the move direction dot X for move direction dot Y, because of course Y is going to be the left right movement value in Unreal. Besides that, we're doing exactly the same clamp between the value which is being passed in and clamping that to minus one or one. Then all of this is going to be calculated and updated in the tick event. So this is the bit which is kind of happening. This is a very simplified version of what's happening, I suppose, in the character movement component class. So on the tick, all of this information is being updated and applied as an offset to the moving pawn or the moving character. So in the tick function, what we have here is I'm checking if the movement direction, so the value which is being updated, isn't equal to zero. So this is a built-in function. We can say the f vector dot is zero, and I'm checking at the negative value of this. So if isn't movement direction dot zero, so if we're having a value returned here, then we know that we want to apply some sort of movement. For this, I've created a new constant f vector named new location, and that is equal to the get actor location plus, and then I want to do this calculation separately. So inside of some brackets, I've got the movement direction multiplied by delta time to make this frame rate independent, and then multiply applied by the movement speed. So this is where the movement speed comes in, because if we didn't use this otherwise, we'd either be using uh, the value of what's being pressed. So we would be moving at one unit every tick, and that's obviously going to be very, very slow. So what we want to do is multiply this by a movement speed as well. And again, this is the equivalent of using the walk speed. This is what's happening in the character movement component. The walk speed is being multiplied by the direction and the delta time to get the final speed to move the character. So once we have that, we now have a value, but this isn't doing anything. And that's where the final statement here comes in, which is the set actor location. So we now want to take all of these calculations and we want to make that the new location of our character. So we're going to say set actor location to the new location. And this is working, of course, because we're getting the current actor location just above and adding to that. So we can then set that new calculation to be the new desired destination, essentially. And that's it. So this is, like I said, is very, very simple uh, and a, a much more simplified version of what's actually happening in the character class. But when we press play, we can see if we've got the movement speed set to be the same, you get roughly the same results. And the main difference, like I've said, is that the character class has a whole bunch of extra logic going on which uh, accounts for things like the acceleration, the max acceleration, and getting up to that maximum speed that we can set. And that's something you could definitely set quite easily in the pawn class, but this was more just to uh, see how to get a pawn moving around because we cannot use the built-in character movement component functionality on a pawn. So we have to kind of do things a little bit more from the ground up. So with all of that done, go ahead and compile the project and then move back on over to the engine. Okay, so back in the pawn class, hopefully that now makes a little bit more sense of why we have the movement speed. Again, if we doubled this, then again, if we press play, we're going to get a much faster moving pawn. And the other thing that you may notice when you're going around and doing this is that you're not going to be getting collisions and things with the walls as you would with a character class, because again, all of this is actually accounted for in the capsule component. Um, and all of this is kind of pre-set up in the class. So if you're going from scratch, there's quite a lot to learn when using a pawn class, but that is kind of the fun is getting an understanding of what the character class is kind of doing under the hood and being able to implement all of that yourself into a pawn class, which will in the end give you much more control over how your character or pawn is interacting with the world. So I'll leave that video here for now though. As always, if you enjoy the video or find it useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That always helps and is greatly appreciated. Just wanted to say another huge thank you to all of the Patreon supporters showing your support for the channel and the content over on the Patreon page. And again, always remember that you can download these project files early to kind of follow along or just dig through the code alongside the tutorials through certain tier rewards over there. And of course, remember, if you wanted to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the weekly tutorials or some of the extras that I release from time to time, then do be sure to hit the subscribe button and press the notification bell so that you get those updates. As ever, though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.